Hey guys, sorry I was a couple of minutes late. I was busy ed editing the photos that were going to be popping on on uh, online, so on the screen. So I had to do that quickly before we we uh, went live. Uh, it took me a couple of minutes longer than I thought it was going to be. Uh, today we've got Karina on again. If you guys haven't already seen the first time round with Karina, it was really really good one of the more informative and kind of intense sessions we did we just went through everything um that you could think about doing a retreat in endo today we're going to look at perioendo but we're also going to maybe let's have a little bit of a chat see what's going on and uh um, and go through a couple of bits and pieces any questions that you guys have would be great karina hey how's it going Hi, yeah. how are you good uh i was r racing against the clock there to uh, edit those photos <laughs> Um, Probably my fault. I sent them to you a little bit late. <laughs> yeah, and then yeah, it just took me ages to to get the the damn thing to download. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> I took screenshots in the end, and then sent the screenshots from my iPad to my phone, and then back and all sorts. So it's it's done. Oh, sorry. It's done really <laughs> um, and they look really really good. So let's pop our cover on because we have a cover today. How cool does that look? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> very nice. <laughs> um, so yeah. Um, Last time out, I was just telling the guys that last time out when you came on, it was one of the more kind of, I think we went through anything you could possibly think about when you're going to do a retreat. It was, it was unreal. I think, I think a lot of guys kind of picked up a lot of things for that. There's guys going through finals right now. Um, yeah. Anyone who's watched that probably learned all of Endo in one hour. So <laughs> thanks. Well, I'm glad it was nice. Time. It was nice. It was nice chatting to you. Yeah, uh, how have you how have you managed since the last time? I think it's about four or five weeks since we uh, we spoke yeah. last, wasn't it? Yeah, no, it's been good. Um, I mean, this last week has really been um, sorting the practice out and get it getting it ready to sort of reopen. Um, mm. So we've just had a lot of staff training and putting up our perspex screens and um, trying to sort of order shields from my microscope and things like that. So I've done a lot of staff training this week about how, how sort of our operating procedures are going to be when we get back. So it's been a busy week, actually. That's an interesting point, actually, because um, how, how are you going to keep your scope clean uh, and stuff? Yeah, so um, I'm in the. I ordered. Um, I made some sort of rough dimensions and ordered a perspex um, spe uh, shield for it. Um, it's basically yeah. something that just goes over the eyepieces um, and covers um, sort of the rest of the area. So any sort of spray back will go onto the shield rather than uh, me or my nurse. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but the measurements I, I did were slightly shorter than what I wanted. So I'm having to remeasure tomorrow to get it ordered again for next week. Um, so I get a bit of trial and error, but because I'm making my own, I think it just just needs a little bit of playing with to get it right. Yeah, um, I'm trying to find the photo actually, but my my um, the manufacturer who made mine, they've come out with something, um, okay. and it, it looks pretty good. It, it looks a bit small for for my liking, to be fair. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't cover the uh, the nurse's size. Um, yeah. But she'll be wearing a full face shield. She doesn't need to see down any of the eyepieces or anything because we've got a screen ready, yeah. um, so she can see that. Um, Great, yeah. I can't. When see... are you? When are you back? Have you decided? Um, I'm very, very hesitant to go back. To be honest, I I live with my grandmother. She's got uh, a lot of health considerations, so we've got to be really careful with what we do and don't do. So yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know yet. I'm, I'm kind of weighing up the uh, pros and cons at the moment. So obviously yeah. we just had the letter today. So I've been, I've been calling friends going, what are you guys doing? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and now we're just, we're just like, oh God. Um, it's kind of taking I think it's the mask supply. situation that's one of the hardest ones, isn't it? Because to source, all the, source everything and get everything fit tested is going to be a bit of a, a difficult thing in, in a week, for a week. So we'll see how it goes. God, that's not what I wanted. Where's it gone? <laughs> um i've yeah i can't find it oh that's okay. um you can send it to me after yeah no but it's it's, it's perspex it goes around the eyepieces and one around the the lights you know the actual light unit at the bottom so yeah kind of do a double protection but they do look a bit small so that's it's gonna be interesting yeah um, the one i made is definitely too small um because i i thought you know you need a little bit more room um to work with but actually i think the shield can be quite quite large so um, I'm, I'm going back in and sort of remeasuring tomorrow to see what what I can get away with. Um, yeah. Bigger. So I don't know if you've caught any of the ones we've do been doing recently, um, 
we've had a really, really important addition to what we do now. Uh, you've got to put down your five most used emojis. My <laughs> <laughs> Oh God! Um, so they're so going up again, and they change daily, actually, which is interesting. So, guys, th those are mine. Um, we're going to see what Karina oh, no. has. Uh, do, I need to put, do I need to put them in? Yeah, go for it, guys. In the guys in the comments, I see yours as well. Um, we're going to talk perioendo today, so that's kind of probably where we want to dive in. I want some questions as well from you guys who are watching. Uh, what kind of issues or questions you have with perioendo? Um, combined lesions, issues that you've uh, come across. You used to fish more often than anything else. <laughs> I quite like that fish. It's <laughs> been a, um, since Corona lockdown one that I've quite enjoyed. <laughs> mm, mine's been that one. That's all oh, I've yeah. used with, uh, <laughs> since Corona, I think. Um, but yeah, uh, so this case that we've got in today, well, let's let's have a little look at that, and then we can we can chat a bit more after as well. Uh, first slide here we go great so I mean I think when we're talking about perioendo the first thing that sort of pops into my head is the classification that I use um, mm. and I mean it's it's not really to do with the new perio classification that's come out I sort of find it very easy to use um, how we sort of describe it in endo so for me it's sort of it's either primary um, endo which we'll, we can go through um, and which this case mainly is um, yeah. primary perio or we're looking at a combined lesion. So it's either primary perio, secondary endo, or primary endo, secondary perio, um, or a true combined lesion. So I think it's just starting with this one. Um, it's obviously, this is a um, true, uh, sorry, a primary um, endo lesion. Yeah. Um, and it's a little bit confusing actually to differentiate what a primary endo lesion is compared to a cracked tooth. Um, yeah. So what it, what it means um, is that the infection that's associated with that tooth is main is you know is fully due to the root canal space. Um, but if we look at the radiograph, there's a, a J-shaped radiolucency there, so it's mm. quite easy to jump and think, okay, this is a cracked tooth. Um, and you wouldn't be wrong to sort of you know really Maybe think consider that. that because we're looking at a last standing um, sort of molar because the wisdom tooth um, was out of the um, out of occlusion. Um, we've got this J-shaped radiolucency. We've got a large amalgam present. Um, so, you know, it very well could be um, a cracked tooth that we're seeing. Yeah. Um, but if we look a little bit closer, we can see that I've traced the sinus um, on the distal aspect of the tooth. Um, and it's coming from the base of um, the distal root. Um, yeah. So that's what all that's happening is um, the infection has got large. Um, large infections like to drain through the easiest um, path of drainage. Um, and particularly in the lower mandible, because the cortex, the buccal cortex is so thick, um, the lesions quite often want to drain either through the fication. So that's the picture more on the right hand side where we can see um, there's a pocket going into the fication and an abscess in the fication area yeah. um, or um, via the ridge. Um, um, so like we're seeing in the, the first um, photo on the sort of left hand side. Um, and that's purely because the cortex is so thick. So although, you know, for upper teeth, for example, or anterior teeth, the easiest path of drainage is um, through the um, apical aspect. Yeah, we get a buccal abscess near the apex of the tooth. For uh, lower, anti lower molar teeth, um, it's not the same thing. So sometimes we do see these narrow isolated pockets or J-shaped radiolucencies. Um, mm. And you have got this communication between the gingival margin um, and the base of the tooth. So it is sort of a perioendo lesion, um, but it's primary endo in its um, nature. Yeah. I think that's uh, probably a, a really useful kind of tool, the uh, GP sinus tracing. You can see where it's coming from. Yeah. Uh, but if you do that, how can you differentiate? Is that going to help you differentiate between a primary perio and a primary uh, endo? Um, well, I mean, for the first case, we can see that there was a sinus distal to the tooth. Um, yeah. So tracing that, I think, um, is quite useful just to see where it's coming from. Um, so I think if you've got a sinus on the ridge area, you're more likely thinking it's a primary um, primary per, uh, endo lesion. Yeah. Um, whereas if you've got a narrow isolated pocket, that could still be a primary endo lesion, but you'd be a little bit more, you know, hard pressed to know if that's a crack or not. Um, so, for example, in the second photo on the uh, right hand side, um, that you know that there's got there's a crown on that tooth. There's a narrow isolated pocket. Yeah. Um, so that very well could be a crack, and we wouldn't know. Um, until we removed that crown and had a had a little look because both primary um, endo lesions and cracked teeth can have narrow isolated pockets 
um, associated. It's yeah, just that yeah. you shouldn't jump to the fact that it's a crap tooth when um, you see these sorts of signs on lower molar teeth, because quite often they do drain through this pathway. Yeah, you, you probably before you decide that, unless you can see the crack, first off, you, you probably want to access because you can see, you know, some periapical pathology. So yeah, obviously, then if you access and you see a crack running through the floor of the pop chamber core, out it comes. But you can't be sure until that point. So yeah, I, I would agree there. Um, I don't know if this is a bit of a cheeky question, but does it matter whether something is a perio first a, a lesion or an endo first lesion? Is the treatment going to be that much different? You're still going to do some uh, endodontics to to clear up whatever's in the tooth, and you're going to do some perio to stop whatever's um, around the sides of the tooth as well. Um, yeah, I mean it matters like quite quite significantly because the prognosis um, is totally different for both of these um, for both of these. So if it's um, for example here where this is of endo origin, um, this to and it's primary endo, there's no perio involved. Um, this tooth will only need endo treatment. And the prognosis um, is pretty good, actually, for these sorts of lesions. Um, I would say for something like this, probably, you know, 75, 85%, something between those ranges. Um, yep. So it's very, very good. Whereas um, we're going to see cases later on, which are primary perio um, in origin and secondary endo in origin. And actually their, their prognosis of those cases is, you know, very, very guarded, yeah. actually, because um, we know our endo treatment tends to work quite well. Um, whereas peri when the perio is, you know, that significant that it's caused an endodontic problem, um, the pro long-term prognosis for that tooth is very very poor so what you tend to tell the patient will be completely different things um, and we manage them differently so if yeah. there isn't um, a perio involvement and it's just primary endo we're not going to be carrying out any endo treatment for this at all so for this case for example um, if there if there was a pocket you would do the endo treatment um, and you wouldn't want to actually do any perio treatment at all um, because you, yeah. Um, yeah I mean because you'll get full resolution of that perio issue of that um, uh, of that pocketing depth because the cells that populate that root surface are still there so you'll get full regeneration of that space um whereas you know for for a, you know a perio uh, lesion you you know you would be doing some perio treatment afterwards um so for example i know we're going to come on to it a little bit later but for combined lesions such as primary perio uh, primary endo sorry secondary perio yeah. um we would do we would always do the endo first um, and then we actually wait two to three months just to see what sort of healing we get from the endo mm. um, part of things. And then we would do the um, perio treatment of what's left because the last thing we want to do is remove any cells from the root surface that could potentially regenerate that because um, then we're going to form a long junctional epithelium. Um, oh, and, and that's not good for the patient long term. Yeah. So if we can try and get as much regeneration as possible um, and then do the cleaning of what the perio part is, it's a lot better. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say that uh, I'm, I'm asking these questions as devil, devil's advocate. I'm not actually completely... Yeah, no, of course, I know you are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking I, the way I said it, I was like, oh, is that, is, does he sound like a moron there? No, um, no. <laughs> but yeah, yeah no, so no. you're going to be looking at, for example, you've taken a PA. as the bone level a bit dodgy the whole way through? Have you got pocket, pocket depths everywhere? Uh, do you know, on other teeth as well, that can give you that idea of actually it's a primary endo, or actually it's a, it's a perio uh, issue. And then you can um, tailor your treatment along those lines. And of course, like you said, um, you don't want to scale away uh, those cells, which are going to reform your uh, periodontal ligament and reduce that, you know, um, pocketing depth. Uh, yeah, no, I, just, I just thought, oh God, did I sound really stupid when I asked <laughs> that question? It's an art uh, when you interview, isn't it? Because you want to get the points across, but... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, oh, San Sanchez had a question, actually. Um, what's the ideal magnification used for perio and endo in general practice? Um, I mean, when I, when I do the endo part, so I, I wouldn't do the periodontal part normally. I will work with no. a colleague who will, who will do that. Um, but for endo, I'm using a microscope, so probably 10 times magnification for the endo part of things. Um, mm. And then I'm not sure what periodontists use um, in terms of magnification, but um, well, I, I don't know. I can answer. That's a question for, for when you're online with Rena. Um, yeah, yeah. We're is doing that in a couple of days' time? Actually. It's tomorrow? Okay, cool. Yeah, so guys, yeah. Uh, uh, Karina and Rena are going online tomorrow, so that'll be interesting. I've joined, like, we wanted to know whether the radiograph showing an endo perio or a perio endo lesion. 
So this particular radiograph was uh, endo it was, first, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It's actually just primary, um, primary endo. There's no peri involvement. It, mm -hmm. it is peri involvement because you've got a pocket, but there's no. Um, Perry it's not. A, yeah, it's it? not a primary perio secondary endo because actually um, this will heal completely with just the endodontic treatment alone. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Should we have a little look at the next slide? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to scroll back because I was looking for that microscope picture. <laughs> uh there we are so here we have the next one yeah so i'll sort of walk you through this case because i found it quite interesting um sure. so this um upper first molar um i looked at it and to me i could see a slight radiolucency on the mesial aspect of the root but i didn't think too much of it um when i first um, looked at the tooth i thought okay this is just a straightforward um endo disease um okay. It's got a large amalgam in it. Um, that's probably what's caused um, the pulp to become necrotic. Um, yeah. And then I removed um, the restoration because whenever I'm treating teeth, I always remove the um, a coronal restoration completely. And when I did, I saw that there was a pocket. Um, so it's difficult to see on this screen, but you can just about see my BP probe um, on the top sort of uh, right-hand surface of that tooth. Um, it's gone all the way. So it's pretty much about an 8.5 millimeter pocket. Um, that wow. was present um, and it was an isolated pocket as well so there's you know I'm jumping to is there a crack here um, because you don't often for upper molar teeth um, because the buccal cortex is quite thin um, if there is an infection associated with this tooth we normally get a buccal abscess um, quite yeah. high up we don't normally um, get drainage through the PDL of this of this sort of tooth um, so having a narrow isolated pocket there did make me think, okay, maybe there is a crack here. I couldn't see a crack, but I did tell the patient, okay, you know, there is, a, you know, I can't see one, but there, there isn't many factors here that might cause this pocket mm. to be here apart from the crack. Um, and the patient was like, you know, I, I really want to try and save it. Just, you know, please carry on. Um, so I, I carried on. Um, and if you switch to the next one, just... Yep, let me get that one. Here we are. That's it. Um, so, oh, not that one. There was one, that's the one. <laughs> so what we can see here is when I did the obturation, um, you can just about see there on that um, mesial buccal root, there is a large lateral canal, which we can see the sealer has come out of. Um, and so it's that lateral canal that's caused that periodontal pocket. Yeah. So again, this is a, a primary perio um, case. Uh, oh, sorry, a primary endo case. Um, and that pocket was um, there because that lateral canal, the easiest path of drainage from there was through the PDL. Um, it's already so, in the um, PDL there, isn't it? It's, it's already half, well, a third of the way up the route. So it's quite an easy route for it to take. Yeah. Exactly. So that's another reason why we can sometimes get um, a primary endo lesion or even a primary um, endo secondary periotype lesion. Um, because mm. of these lateral canals, because it's any sort of communication pathway between the endodontic aspect of the tooth and the periodontal aspect of the tooth. Um, so maybe don't give up on these sorts of cases. Um, it's, you know, maybe we can get some good results and, and hold on to these sorts of teeth. Um, so those yeah. two were the main sort of primary um, endo cases I wanted to demonstrate um, here. Yeah, that, that's, that's a really nice kind of, you can't see that on your pre op x-ray which we've just popped back on uh and then you can see just that little uh little little kink on the on the top third of the root so it shows that there's so many different ways that this can present and actually had you not removed that full restoration and you know gotten the tooth naked as my professor used to say like get get yeah. all get all the get all the crap out of the way so you can see the whole ring of uh, enamel were around the, the outside had you not done that and you just gone in and uh, and just accessed through the old restoration you couldn't have made that accurate diagnosis yeah, um exactly. and then obviously it, it, it does make your, your your life a little bit harder because then you've got to rebuild the tooth and re rewall and things like that but um you can't get the the right eye, uh, end result if you don't do that because it, it could there could have been a crack there had you not had you not yeah. checked yeah. So. Or you could have assumed that there was a crack with having that pocket there. And um, it out, it's yeah. only once you dismantle it that you can actually see, you know, I'm not visualizing a crack. So there is a chance this might be something else. Mm. Yeah. 
Uh, and let's have a look at the, the other photos. Oh, how do, how do you differentiate between endoperi and periendo lesions? Which interventor to start first? So that's what we were kind of talking about a little bit earlier, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, so... so recap that. Yeah, um, so uh, if it's primary um, endo, um, then usually there is going to be a large restoration in the tooth, um, something that's resulted in that tooth becoming necrotic. Um, and again, the pocketing that you're seeing, it's not a general pocket. You're looking at usually a narrow, isolated pocket. So mm. there's an area where something is draining from the endodontic um, aspect. Um, the next sort of thing is primary perio. Um, and the way you differentiate primary perio um, is that the, the tooth is often vital. Um, yeah. So quite often I get referrals from um, like periodontists or, or even general dentists saying, um, you know, this is a, um, there's a lesion, a large lesion associated with the tooth and um, will you please root treat this? Um, and quite often these teeth can be unrestored. You know, sometimes they can be restored, um, but it's really, you know, you see a, a wide general pocketing, maybe some pus coming from the gingival margin um, and you vitality test these teeth um, and you, you notice that actually they're vital. Um, yeah. What I would recommend is definitely um, using something that's very cold. So we want something like endofrost rather than ethyl chloride, which is definitely not cold enough. So I think ethyl chloride is sort of minus five degrees Celsius, whereas endofrost is minus 50 degrees Celsius. Uh, so you want something significantly cold, you know, that, that we're going to get a response because yeah. perio, um, you know, quite advanced perio can cause some sorts of calcifications of the root canal system. So with a standard t uh, test, you may not get a response. Um, I also think EPT is also fantastic for these cases because um, quite often in practice, I find actually um, they're not responding to um, the cold testing, but you put EPT on there and they do respond. Um, so, you know, you can differentiate primary perio from prime primary endo from just those sort of basic um, tests. Yeah. Um, obviously with, with primary, if it is a primary perio case, sometimes you do see radiolucency around the apex and things like that, but because the tooth is vital, you doing an endodontic treatment on that is not going to do anything to help the prognosis of that tooth. Um, so we no, wouldn't... The, the, the source of the infection is still being untreated, so you're exactly. not going to see that resolution. And I think if from from my kind of understanding at the moment obviously you've got a lot more experience than i have and people like rena as well uh i always try and think of where is the infection coming from as opposed to where maybe the the symptoms are yeah because if you go okay well what what's the root cause of the, of the well pardon the pun but <laughs> yeah what's the root cause of the actual issue and you go to in and you and you kind of think about it a bit more and go actually the there's pocketing everywhere and this one's just particularly bad and now there's a periapical lesion but we have seven millimeter pockets across the mouth it's probably an, uh, a primary perio and, and uh, a lesion as opposed to uh, oh this has got now now devitalized and, and needs an endo uh, yeah definitely alone. looking at the whole mouth is you know key for these sorts of diagnoses mm. um it's, I think it becomes a lot more difficult to differentiate um, and diagnose the, the lesions that are combined. Um, so primary perio, secondary endo, and secondary endo to primary perio. Um, yeah. Those things um, can be a lot more difficult um, when it comes to diagnosis because the pulp is necrotic and you've also got some perio involved. So those can be quite difficult and some of it is a guessing game for those sorts of lesions. Um, and again, looking at the rest of the mouth is really, is really useful and can help. In your experience, when you have a combined lesion, does your vitality testing and, you know, uh, percussion testing, et cetera, et cetera, is that still pretty clear cut or does having the perio disease kind of obfuscate the, the results of a vitality test at all? Uh, no. So um, obviously, if, if they're a true combined sort of lesion um, yeah. or even, a, a you know, any sort of combined lesion where it's primary perio, secondary endo or, or vice versa, um, the, the, the vitality test will be negative. Um, and so, you know, it's very difficult to differentiate where the infection has come from first yeah. uh, quite often. Um, yeah. OK, that's, so, that makes sense. I ho hopefully, I'll catch that's answered your question. Just let us know if there's anything you're still unsure of. Uh, we've got a question from Ismail. He's asking, would you take CBCTs in these cases after removing the restoration? I would say probably not um, to check for, certainly not to check for lateral canals. What, is that something that you would agree with? Um, we could actually in a case like this, because what it would have highlighted is um, that there is um, a distinct radiolucency in the mid third of the root. Um, right. 
I, I, I didn't because I think it's di sometimes it is difficult with CBCT because this would have shown probably a J-shaped lesion, maybe not involving the apex as much. So it would have given us a little bit more information. Um, mm. But I, again, it's, it, again, it was quite a large lateral canal. So we might have actually been able to see the lateral canal on this particular case, just because yeah. it was very large. Um, but in most cases, we can't see lateral canals on a, on a CBCT. Um, but yeah, I, I don't tend to do it for this sort of thing. Um, yeah, I, I was I was more kind of uh, asking whether you would actually take it. So he's he's maybe saying mid treatment taking it to check for a lateral as opposed to pre treatment to see what's going on. Yeah, I mean some people do take mid treatment. Okay. Um, mid treatment it do, it does give you a little bit more information at this stage. Um, but I mean I, I couldn't see a crack. You can't see cracks, yeah. fine cracks on a CBCT. There's you know a lot of evidence which shows that. Um, if you know if there was a crack here, we wouldn't have been able to see it on a, a cone. Sometimes fine, you know, la fine laterals we can't see on a cone beam CT. So it, in this case, maybe it would have we would have got a bit more yeah. information because of the size of the lateral. But actually, in most cases, probably wouldn't have got a significant amount of information at this stage. I would say. Yeah, cool. Uh, I think that makes sense. Uh, any other questions? I think Alkish said that he's happy with uh, the answer. I think he's 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 clocked it. So that's brilliant. <laughs> Um, Alma is saying great tips in diagnosing. Anything on the tab? No, let's have a look at the, the final slide. Yeah. Uh, was it this one here? I think it was. Yeah. So this was um, a, a combined sort of lesion. Um, so this one was a primary perio secondary endo. So the yep. one that I talked about has the poorest prognosis. Um, so what happens is with primary perio secondary endo, um, you've got significant perio disease and the bacteria have reached the tooth from either sort of lateral canals or large tubules, dental tubules, or more often through the apex of the tooth. So from the apical foramen. It can also have happened. So for this patient, he'd had a lot of perio treatment um, from a periodontist before. And obviously um, with perio treatment, they're trying to do root surface debridement to um, stabilize the perio. And sometimes yeah. that treatment as well can sever the blood supply um, from the apex of the tooth and result in pulp necrosis as well. Mm. Um, so this tooth definitely has a guarded um, long-term prognosis. It was slightly mobile, in fact. I think it was sort of grade one to two mobile. Um, but this patient was under the care of um, a periodontal specialist, um, really motivated um, to keep his teeth for as long as possible. Um, he'd been spoken to by the periodontist and said, you know, these teeth don't have a great long term prognosis. We don't know how long they'll last. Um, and they're definitely sort of on their way out. Um, but if you want to keep them for as, as long as possible, we need to maintain excellent oral hygiene. Yeah. Um, and, you know, have regular perio treatment. Um, and he'd complied um, in, a, in a really good way. So he'd, you know, was completely compliant. His oral hygiene was absolutely fantastic. Um, he did still have some pocketing. Um, so when I saw him for a consultation, I said to him, you know, this is primary perio, secondary endo. Um, we can do the endo treatment. And the benefit that we'll have is, say you're having perio treatment, we've no longer got an endo source of infection, which maybe is causing the perio not to work. Yeah, you've um, removed that reservoir. Yeah. Exactly. It's not going to regrow your bone levels. You're not, it's not going to improve your mobility significantly, maybe very slightly. Um, but it, it may give you a little bit longer with the tooth. Whether that is months or years, it's difficult to predict because obviously it's right down to him and his oral hygiene yeah. um, and, and how much peri treatment he's having. Um, and so what I did was um, I did the, he, you know, he was very understanding. He, his aim was just to keep the tooth for as long as possible. Um, and for me, I mean, if it's a tooth that I would save in my mouth, even if it was for a year or two, gives him that function at the back because, um, you know, the, a lot of his teeth are poor prognosis here. They all had, you know, significant peri disease. And by extracting that tooth, we're then putting more pressure on the teeth on either side. So it sort of, in, you know, enhances yeah. that cycle of potentially he will lose other teeth. So, um, I, you know, after that conversation, we decided to go ahead with root canal treatment. Yeah. And um, so I sort of went in um, and did uh, the root canal treatment. Uh, the tooth was necrotic when I tested it with um, EPT as well. So, you know, I was, I was sure this was a definite endo uh, lesion with perio. Um, and you can see I kept the access as small as uh, feasible um, because, you know, there's no... Five canals in there. I was, I was trying to have a little look. I just, I just cool. uh, zoomed in. 
a four it, and a little lateral I think <laughs> yeah I, th I think the lateral is the one I was going is that an extra one there because that, <laughs> that looks fun yeah um and you know this patient had pocketing to pretty much the apex of his tooth so mm -hmm. um and it was it was generalized pocketing he had peri in the rest of his mouth so that's how the diagnosis was um formed here um and for him i mean the only difference in long-term care is i didn't advise a cuspal coverage restoration um so for most molars i will you know always advise cuspal coverage restoration but you can see we've kept everything very small um, there isn't actually that much pressure he's probably putting on his teeth because his teeth are slightly mobile. So I'm not worried about him sort of trying Correct, to crack, yeah. <laughs> crack something with it. Mm -hmm. um, so we've, you know, gone for just leaving the teeth like this with a composite core. Um, uh, but it's a very unusual case. So I don't normally recommend that sort of thing, but this. I do. Yeah, R Rashina's asking, did you get any reduction in the mobility of the tooth post RCT? Um, I, do you know what? I treated this patient probably three or four months before lockdown. So I, I would have reviewed him, but I haven't had a chance, unfortunately. Um, I do assume it will be a little bit, um, I'm, I'm expect, I never usually tell a patient it's gonna improve the mobility because I don't want them to get their hopes up. You know, I'm very sort of mm. frank when it comes to primary perio, secondary endo. I don't treat many cases because of the prognosis of that tooth. You know, an implant is often a better option for these sorts of patients. Um, but here you can see the position of the sinus He's, um, you know, if this teeth come out, he's going to need external sinus lifts um, and he's a perio patient. You know, he's genetically prone to perio. Um, so that's why we're trying to keep these teeth rather than go for implants. Um, yeah. But um, I, I would have, but I would have assumed we would have got some improvement in the mobility. Um, yeah, I, th I think you kind of touched upon something that I'm, I'm quite interested in. Alkish, we'll come to your question shortly. Um, but it's that loss of one tooth leading to more pressure or of occlusal force on another on the rest of the the mouth um mm -hmm. are you aware of any like re i was trying to look this up earlier because we were doing some uh, mock finals with the uh, people from newcastle okay. um their finals are next week so some of the guys i think you're involved with deciduous a little bit aren't you so yeah. um you know what's going on there so we, we were helping those guys um and i was trying to trying to find something that was um along these lines because it makes sense in your head that you lose one tooth you've lost one pair if you lose another tooth that's not the opposite part of that pair then you're down two pairs and it's really really quite quick to then actually have not very many pairs of actual teeth which are functioning and then the thought process is how how does that really affect everything else are we then going to see loads of cracks because there's a lot of force going down these teeth if they're heavily restored you're going to see more and more of that as well is that going to lead to devitalization? It's just quite a, it's, it's like a very slippery slope in my mind. And Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think you don't appreciate that until, um, you know, you often hear that from patients, you know, oh, I lost this one. And since I've lost that one, I've had problems with this one. And then I've had problems with this one. And, and you do think actually, you know, if you can try and save them and the patient sort of understands that that process, it's, it's best to try really. Mm, yeah. It's, it's one of those things that you try and get across to them, but when somebody's in pain, they, I think you're going to be getting a lot of that at the moment with these UDCs, yeah. you know, the urgent dental care centres where yeah. the patient's been in pain for a bit too long. And at that point, they just don't care. They're not thinking, actually, if I lose this when I'm 25, yeah. uh, within 10 years, this is the first tooth I've lost, I'm probably losing three or four more. Yeah, I know you often see it when patients are in pain, don't they? They're like, just get it out. And then you've mm -hmm. extricated it and then they come back and they think, they're like, oh no, I want to save it actually because they're yeah. not in that pain anymore and that, that mindset of just get it out, anything to make it stop. <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. that's that's the real trouble. Is there any tips, tips that you've got? I know we're getting slightly off topic with the, uh, the endo-perio-endo -peri -peri side of things. Any tips that you've got for those cases where somebody's coming in pain and you're thinking they sh really shouldn't be losing this too. This is a small... A small lesion it's it's going to be nicely saved with with an endo yeah. um how can they make sure that doing this access is going to get them out of pain and they're going to come back and be accepting of the fact that actually yeah we can we can go with an endo for this one and and, and save the tooth as opposed to going just get it out i don't care anymore yeah <laughs> um well, i think it's it's always better for those cases where you think that you know when you're a general dentist, you see that patient quite frequently and you sort of know their mindset already, um, you know, if that patient is a motivated patient. So if they're in pain and they're like, take it out, I think it's always a good, you know, it's always better to try and extirpate if you can, just to give them a little bit more time to think about things. 
And obviously it's the patient's will. If they want to have it out, then at that next visit, you take it out. But I think to immediately jump to extraction for those patients that are making a rash decision. Um, in terms of extirpating, I do think that it's all to do with time. So quite often you're, you're treating, you know, if you're in the NHS or even like an emergency that's been fitted in between a few of your patients, even if you're a private dentist, mm. it's quite difficult sometimes to find the time to fully clean and shape that tooth. Um, especially if it's a hot pulp, because sometimes, you know, you know, you're entering that tooth, it's difficult to numb up. Um, so I find um, things like um, Ledimix or an antibiotic steroid paste um, really, really good for getting patients out of pain um, when they've got hot pulps. I don't advocate it yeah. as a sort of an interim medicament, but more as a no. um, just to get that patient out of pain when they've got irreversible pulpitis. I just think it helps really calm things down. Um, you barely need to, you know, make a hole in the pulp chamber roof to get the lid mix to do its job. Um, so I, I just think that that is a, a really good way of um, getting a patient out of pain when they've got a hot pulp. Yeah, I, th I think it's something that we're possibly going to see quite a lot of. So I thought it might be a good idea to kind of cover that as well. Um, I mean, ideally, if you with hot pulps, if you can remove the full roof of the pulp chamber um, and just that coronal pulp tissue, um, yeah. that is the you know the ideal way to get that patient out of pain. Um, whereas if you've got a necrotic pulp and an abscess, um, you know you do want to try and clean and shape the canals if you can because you want to try and really like get you know disinfect the, the root canal as best as possible um, mm. but i think for hot pulps as long as the coronal pulp is removed if you put something like leather mix in there that is a really you know effective way of getting that patient out of pain yeah i think that makes sense um so we went off topic there and i'm trying to remember okay. what i said what, what i was about to ask you which was back on topic uh we'll go with alkish's question for the moment from a clinician side in a grade two mobile case uh do you consider motivating the patient uh, more or going for a definitive treatment with a confirmed result. So I think he's asking about the perio size. Do you do a load of, you know, OHI, et cetera, et cetera, before you'll dive in? Yes, 100%. Like that, pay for, for, I mean, like I said, I very rarely treat primary perio secondary endo because mm -hmm. um, it's got such a poor prognosis. Um, you're just trying to, you're not, you're not trying to get, back to healthy really you're quite often just trying to extend the life of that tooth um and it's not really the endo that's hard work it's the perio side that's hard work um, yeah. so i think that if you're a general dentist you need to basically make sure you've done with ohi the patient has shown good you know good compliance with your um treatment that you're doing good oh you know everything's like pretty much spot on you need a highly motivated patient um who totally understands you know has, has good informed consent that this tooth is not lasting very long um and then you dive into the endo side of things yeah uh, i think that makes sense uh, well even on the perio side you're not going to well you shouldn't be doing perio treatment until somebody is uh motivated cleaning properly yeah um changed all the factors that that are an issue as well um Oh, yeah, that's right. Great talk, guys. Uh, studies by Kesa, Witter and Kano would suggest that the loss of posterior teeth doesn't cause dysfunction. Um, I'll have to have a look at that one, man. Um, yeah. I mean, I think what, what they're saying is like, um, I guess, a, occlusion um, doesn't enhance perio disease in stable no. perio. I know that. I mean, perio side of things, I'm not the, the person to ask. But I mean, I, I, I think just looking at this patient, he's got several mobile teeth in his mouth. Um, so the loss of one, I, I, I mean, maybe there isn't significant evidence to prove that they will weaken the other teeth or cause increased mobility in the, in the other teeth. But I would assume that losing one here um, would cause more mobility in the ones if they're already mobile on the adjacent ones. Um, mm. Just because of the increased sort of force you're now putting on, on, on those teeth. Um, but there are, prob you know, if you look at evidence, there's always evidence one way and another way. Um, and it, it's yeah. very difficult to, to do studies on, on teeth like this because you have to monitor the patient for a significant period of time. Um, and often clinical studies aren't able to do that um, in the settings that they're done in. Um, yeah, so I think you would have to have some sort of like a, almost like the, uh, the fluoride review. Do you remember the one that was uh, done up in Newcastle? I can't remember the name of it, where, where they did a, a section where it was fluoridated, a section where it was non-fluoridated, went back every four or five years for I think it was it was a good long time they were doing it. It was a very longitudinal study and then they obviously came out with the the results that showed that fluoridation of the water was causing a huge 
drop in the DMFT scores, yeah. which is now pretty widely accepted. Um, that's, I mean, that's a fairly, you can, I mean, it's a difficult study to do, but it's, you've mm -hmm. got a big population there um, yeah. to, to study. Um, for these sorts of cases, it's difficult so, to get the patients to, to monitor that sort of thing right through. Um, do you know, to get a whole bunch of patients which you've taken the tooth out and a whole bunch that you haven't, the motivation level between the patients is completely different. You know, there's a lot of fact there, occlusion's different. It's very difficult to, to monitor. But I think if you would just sort of assume, if it was your mouth, you know, the, yeah. the sort of taking one, mo if you've got four mobile teeth in the mouth, you take one of them out, you, you, you worry that the others are having more pressure on them. Well, just imagine about what it, if you lost a couple of canines, let's just say we lost both our upper threes somehow, uh, whether it was by trauma or, or infection, you now then lost your guidance. So then you're moving your teeth in a very funny way to try and get everything back and chewing properly. So there's a, been a big change in your occlusal uh, scheme there. So I, I, yes. I, would, I would think, I, I know that we have, you'd have to study this properly and things that it would make a big difference to your quality of life and how you're eating and then the knock-on yeah. effects of the teeth further on. I think um, maybe if you get someone who's um, uh, who's an occlusal ex expert, perio occlusal yeah. expert on here, it would probably get better answers. Uh, unfortunately, that's definitely not me. I'm more the yeah, endo side we're of things. <laughs> we're totally spitballing here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It would it would need some sort of like a forty a forty year review almost from you know kind of adulthood yeah. till till uh, till the grave where you could work yeah. out what. Uh, and I, uh, I teach over at Guys, so we're um, sort of all involved in the, the clinical research that's, that's, in, that's, you know, we carry out there. And mm -hmm. I'm telling you, to get a one-year recall of above 60% is super difficult, really, really yeah. difficult. So, oh, yeah. I wonder if technology could help us there, because now if, if you're coming in, your notes are online. So I wonder if there's some way it could just link up and anonymize the data and say, X patient had a tooth out. You know there's perio or no perio, because we, we log that sort of thing. And then they could they could you know exclude for factors or include factors that could be quite useful but everyone's on a different system uh some people are and aren't logging things so <laughs> it's uh it's going to be difficult but yes. i think that's quite interesting <laughs> um we're getting really obsolete here so uh hot pulp harris is saying he did trust your opinion on the case and oh, yeah. the case. so he's, he's thrown his own his own suggestion of the um the papers out the window straight away <laughs> uh, favorite anesthesia protocol for a hot pulp because some people are using a combination of lidocaine articaine um what's your go-to yeah so um i i do lidocaine first um and then i usually give us if i so say i've got a patient with irreversible pulpitis i know that you know that temperature sensitive to hot cold all that sort of thing and normally i will give lidocaine first i will always give an articaine as well Mm. Um, I will then normally blow my three in one on their tooth. Um, and if they can still feel it and you know, really hot pulps, they can still feel that. Um, so before I even reach for my drill, it'll normally be a three in one first just to check. Um, and then I will give, um, usually an intraligamentary, um, injection. So on the mesial aspect and the distal aspect of the tooth, because that's where the intraligamentary injection tends to be absorbed the best. Um, yeah. and I find that intraligamentary really, really useful. I find that, you know, quite quite noticeable um, improvement in the pain quite often even if you've given a buccal infiltration um, with lidocaine and articaine and um, they will still feel that intraligamentary um, yeah. injection um, so yeah I give that um, once I've given that usually things are, are better um, and I will usually start my access um, cavity quite often if you as you still approach the pulp or make a small perforation to the pulp they may still feel that again um, and I will normally give an intrapulpal um, infiltration as well. So I'll, um, I'll normally tell them that you may feel this for a couple of seconds. I'm going to um, do it again. So we're just going to go and do that. And yeah. patients really yeah. appreciate that. I think if that, you know, instead of them suddenly feeling it without you warning them, um, you say, you know, you may feel this one. And then I will always give an intrapulpal um, infiltration. There are other ones, things like intraosseous injections, um, where you can make a small... Um, sort of pinprick um uh, drill hole through into the bone and give a give an intraosseous injection um but i have to say I'd, i haven't i've never given one of those because i've never felt the need to um usually you've got to be super careful with those if you go offline yeah. a little bit for example on the lower you've got your uh, mandibular foramen you know be perforating a root uh yeah. by knocking into the wrong spots <laughs> that, that's i think it, it works very well 
uh, I can't remember who I spoke about it before, with it, uh, about that particular technique. It might have been Abzendo, actually, ABS Endo. Um, he, I think he spoke about it very briefly. He says he uses it every now and then. I think it was him. He says it uses yeah. every now and then. Um, yeah. But it's not your initial first off, you know, no. off the rack go-to um, uh, method. What, what uh, gauge needle are you using for the, uh, for the PDL? um oh gosh i can't tell you the gauge but it's the it's my small one it's like the one i use for infiltrations um but i've also got um the the, the perio press gun yeah yeah um which again is is really useful just because um when you're giving those sorts of injections there is a risk that the cartridge the glass and the cartridge can burst um mm. so those sorts of guns are quite quite useful um, yeah but... because we, we had three different ones in university we had the the long one uh, again, I, I think it's 25 uh, gauge yeah. for your IDBs. And then it was a 27, or is it the other way around? Yeah. I, I, remember I think it was a 27 and 25 for your, your, your block in your IDB. Yeah. And then we had the pen one, which was actually really, really short. It was it was less than an inch long. Yeah, that's, that's the one. micro thin. And yeah. it's, it was quite difficult. You had to like almost pump your hand to get, and then stab it all the way around the tooth. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, that's that's the one. <laughs> yeah, you definitely then, don't want to be using anything large, um, like things that you use an ID block for. You're just not going to get the pressure or, um, you know, that what you want. So you want to be using something very small. Um, the gun's usually quite useful, but um, even if you do use your normal infiltration needle, I do find that actually works if it's mm. not, you know, a really hot pulp, um, and you give it measly and distally, like I said, um, because those are the best places to to give those injections. Yeah, I quite liked the the, the way it worked because you could you could edge your way around the tooth and give a little bit, give a little bit, and then you get to one spot and there'd be a little jump because you hit the bit that's not got an anesthetized and then yeah. there's instant relief and uh, you, then you know you've got it. Yeah. Um, so they're quite good. Uh, caught my phone, it almost fell off the holder. <laughs> uh, Can't get it fixed in lockdown. <laughs> I, I think the, it's actually, um, do you know the thing that you put in your car windscreen? Oh yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. But I put it on a desk. But the little, the little disc underneath where it's sticky, I think it's starting to kind of. Ha it's had its uh, best days. Oh, okay. uh, I might have to get one which clamps onto the actual desk, which might be better. Um, Ismail saying, "Good luck on the recalls of that study once they're out of pain." Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, that's, exactly. That's Do you know what I mean? <laughs> um, they don't. They don't come back. It's really, really difficult. Yeah, so I, I think that's the that's the kind of most of perioendo kind of covered there really um, yeah i mean i'm um, just trying to think if i'd had anything else to say um i guess the only the last bit is just the true combined lesions which means mm. that you have um a little bit of endo you know you've got some endo disease you've got some perio disease and they join together um and that that's sort of the only other one that's very difficult to to fix so you've got a very poor prognosis on those cases um, and I guess your last sort of treatment option for these cases, um, I know we talked about doing the endo first always and then coming back and doing the perio once you've got he as much healing as you can of the endo part of it, um, would be uh, sort of hemisections and root resections um, if the perio can't be solved and you've got a multi-rooted tooth, which sometimes mm -hmm. works quite well. Um, so yeah, I think those are the main points covered. Do you ever use any antibiotics actually uh, for these kinds of cases? I think that's probably the only thing we've not spoke about um no not from an endo point of view um no. so i mean look i quite often work with periodontists i don't think that they use um, antibiotics for these sorts of cases either but i i can't be sure we'd have to we can ask rena tomorrow um, yeah. to see but from an endo point of view no i don't i mean i find that the endo part will you know is the more predictable part it will resolve with root canal treatment um because we've got rid of any necrotic tissue that's in there i think the yeah. challenging part of these cases is the perio side of them yeah, but I, th I think that's uh, that's the thing. Obviously, the perio guys have got the perio chip, perio stat. Whether they're still using those or not, I'm I'm not entirely sure. I'm not quite up to date with the uh, state of play yeah. with those. Uh, I mean, even things like I think their guided tissue regeneration is very difficult for these sorts of cases because it's a multi-walled mm -hmm. defect. Um, so, without talking too much about sort of perio, I think you know guided tissue regeneration is very difficult. But antibiotics and lasers and things, I don't know how well they work in the perio side of things. No. Uh, Hass is in the comments. Hey, man, how you doing? Adonisus just said developmental grooves. Yeah, um, so that quite often we find these in sort of upper um, central or lateral um, incisors. Um, and, you know, these teeth can stay sort of asymptomatic for a long period of time. 
Um, but because there is a groove that runs from sort of normally the CJ region um, to quite far up the route, as soon as you get a little bit of perio issues in that, you know, in that region where the, um, you get the, the junctional epithelium that's lost, you know, you'll get quite quick progression now of the perio disease up that developmental groove. Um, so normally if I do see them, it's sort of prevention, prevention, prevention. So whenever you see laterals or centrals with developmental mm -hmm. grooves, you know, it's telling the patient they've got a groove there, um, telling them that oral hygiene there is really, really important because as soon as that groove starts to develop any perio disease, you're looking at quite, you know, quick progression of that. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, very little treatment um, that, that can be done there. And again, mainly from a perio point of view. Yeah, so a, a lot of this is kind of very mixed and you need to be working alongside somebody who knows what they're doing on the perio side. Otherwise, um, it's almost pointless some of, some of the bits that we do um, because peri patient isn't motivated, peri is not being done correctly. It's just going to, you know, it's not good. It's not going to heal itself. Yeah, it's a waste uh, of their money to spend, you know, to, to do the endo and then... Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, things don't work out for them. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, I've got a question here. When do you do single visit endo? And when do you prefer two visits? Endo? Yeah, so for me, it's um, it's single visit endo for nearly sort of 90, 95% of my work. Mm. There's been big systematic reviews which have compared single visit endo versus multiple visit endo. Um, and everything points to there's no significant difference between the two. Um, if anything, single visit endo always comes out slightly better, but not significantly um, and I think um, a lot of the sort of my reasons for doing um, single visit endo um, is one um, patient factors. Um, so they have to be in the chair once. No one likes having a root canal done. No. Um, it, you know, it's done, it's done in one go. They're, they're finished and, you know, it's back to the dentist for um, cuspal coverage restorations if they need it. Um, the second thing is I, I get to put a definitive a coronal seal in and we know how important a coronal seal is. Um, so my, you know, I put composite core in straight away. I'm yeah. less worried about that tooth breaking in the interim period. And I'm also not worried as much about any sort of leakage because if a temporary filling is lost, um, quite often that, that, you know, as soon as the GP is exposed within a couple of days, we've got bacteria at the apex of the tooth. Um, so I quite like the idea of single visit endo for these sorts of reasons. Um, yeah. But multiple visit endo is also very good. And I, you know, occasionally do it things that you know there's a lot of exudate um, and it's you know we can't get the canal dry to obturate um, sometimes for very very large lesions um, I'll, I'll tend to dress the tooth just to you know it, I don't think it makes a difference but you know for peace of mind I'll, I'll sometimes dress that tooth um, but most of my work is single visit endo. Yeah um, Rasheen is asking a question EPT brand what you use at the moment? Oh um you I think it's called back. Digitest. I, I I think it's called Digitest, but I'll have to check that. I yeah. can't remember. That, like, you a... haven't been at work. You forget everything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, for sure. I think it's Digitest, though. Uh... Um, basically, the ones that are good are um, the ones that um, either the... Um, you don't have to do lots of things with your hand at the same time. So there are ones which basically you put the, the um, metal on the tube and you've got to twist something. Yeah. that's they're more difficult because you need multiple hands for that um so i like the ones you can almost it's either the ones that you sort of press and the, the numbers you know it goes higher Shoots on off. the test yeah or that the patient lets go of um and automatically goes up and the patient lets go of the the um metal thing they're holding on to yeah i think th i think that's that's a pretty it's really annoying the, the little wheel thing because you're there trying to get it on the tooth and, you, and the patient's and then you're trying to, holding, yeah. holding tight and they tighten yeah. up <laughs> uh, so yeah uh yeah has, we're, we're gonna try well i'm gonna try and keep up uh this particular kind of podcasting uh after after the the lockdown ends yeah it's um, nice to see I mean, hassan on this hi hassan <laughs> yeah uh i did a few um back in september um but then i, I we just dropped off we did three well, one one week apart and then and then just did nothing until uh lockdown started so <laughs> hopefully i'm back i'm in the swing of things now uh, we were doing those over Skype and it was really, really difficult to get time. And then the Skype yeah. software was a nightmare. I think this is much more kind of, it's just easier. It's just easier, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. it's all done for you. Yeah. Um, absolute indication for an open dressing. We've got about three minutes left, guys. 
Um, so definitely if um, there is any exudate or bleeding coming from the canal, because you don't want to obturate a canal that's wet, um, because you won't get a good seal with your GP point. Um, that's it. I mean, the only case that I definitely will um, dress other than that is if it's a if it's a retreatment that I'm doing and the initial treatment was very, very good and I can't improve it significantly. Yeah. Um, so I haven't found an extra canal or something like that. Then often I will dress those two. Um, yeah. Or if the patient um, is in pain towards the end of treatment. So for me, usually they don't feel anything throughout the whole treatment. But if towards the end they're still feeling it and I've, and I've numbed up adequately, those sorts of teeth that I will dress. But it's quite rare. Yeah. Uh, um, we're going to be popping this on IGTV, so if anyone's missed the the rest of the the video, don't worry, that's going to go up uh, as soon as I finish. Uh, and we had a question about we always get this question: the rotary system. Have you used high flex? Is it better than Pro Taper, Wave One, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've used them all, <laughs> done all their training courses and stuff. Mm. I think it's whatever works in your hands. Um, so yeah. you know that you know they're all very different systems they all have different feelings um and a lot of studies have been done on this sort of thing like what system is better and actually it's any system that you know your feet you're feeling comfortable in that works in your hands um i think the only other thing is you just want something with um not a huge taper um because we know we want to be more conservative with our prep if we can um so maybe you know don't be finishing on like an f3 pro tape net pro tape a uh, gold or something like that but you know as long as you're you're reasonably conservative in your prep whatever system that you want my favorite yeah. is protaper next if anyone wants to know but you know it's that's a personal opinion what works in my hands yeah i i think it comes down to sometimes the case that you've got in front of you and then again the whatever you're used to and seem to be getting results with i think that's pretty uh it's, it's it doesn't really matter almost as long as you're using yeah. the right the right bits and pieces and doing it correctly yeah. Um, I mean, I, I find Pro Taper Next really good for curved canals, um, which is one of the reasons I use it because I work on quite a lot of curved canals and I find yeah. it quite conservative. Um, it moves in like a um, snake like motion, so it hits a lot of the dentine walls. Um, so, you know, I, I do like it, but there's loads of rotary systems out there that are good. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I can't disagree with anything you said there. I think uh, Hass is in the comments again. Hey, Karina, Moxidum with Deciduous, we spoke about it already um getting you something soon kittens are good <laughs> yeah um diagnosis for a vital tooth with periapical lesion so that's primary perio so again you wouldn't be treating that um with with any sort you just stay away from endo you tell the patient that this actually doesn't need endo this is fully you know due to your perio um and and either leave it to the periodontist general dentist to, to deal with um or that you know if the next step for that tooth is to, to take it out because doing an endo is just not going to help anything in that case that you know the pulp yeah. is vital it's not contributing to that infection and really it shouldn't be too difficult to convince a the patient they don't need a root canal I think no. that's probably, uh, probably the best thing that they'll ever hear. More difficult to convince the periodontist than the dentist. <laughs> yeah, uh, for sure. Uh, no worries, Rashina. No, uh, thank you for putting some questions in. If you've enjoyed today's, I've just got the one minute 30 uh, warning that we're about to get kicked off. Uh, if you enjoyed today, guys, please take a screenshot, pop it on your story, tag, Re tag Karina, uh, tag myself, and I'll share it on my story as well. Um, Thank you for coming on. I think we've uh, we've done a pretty pretty good job of perioendo. Uh, right. Not quite as uh, exhaustive as last time. I think there's a little bit less to talk about than uh, yeah. last yeah. time. Um, but if you if anyone's got any questions, shoot shoot one to me or to Karina. We'll be happy to kind of help you out, guys. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> yeah. No worries. Uh, um, one one question. We've got exactly sixty seconds. See if we manage to get it, get it okay. in. Uh, file retrieval system do you use and recommend so um i really like the irs system um it's a love-hate relationship with that it's that's the instrument removal system um if you're in england you can get it from qed um which are the main distributors of it there's also their tarucci um ultrasonic kit and there's like a loop system that comes with that which is also mm. um very good um the only problem with that is the loop does tend to break um so you can't use it that often and the ultrasonics again you have to be very delicate with the use of them um, yeah. but yeah, those are the, I would say the two, my go-to systems. Um, I really do like the IRS system. Awesome. Uh, guys, thank you for joining us. Make sure you're following Karina. If you're not following me, then you can do if you want. We're going live quite a lot. There's a, a schedule, which is up. 
and please turn on the live notifications. Thanks so much for coming on, Karina. All right. Nice to see you. Bye. Awesome. See you guys. Thank you.